Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show, number 37 this week. Coming up on the show this week, we have some amazing news, but not too much about that for now. There's a whole bunch of other cool stuff coming up. So you're going to check out my new bike cave. We go over to TF Tunes. You're going to see inside the forks and shock on the bike build bike. And we've got an amazing rewind story to tell you. So first up in the news is a slightly revised version of the Propane Rage downhill bike. The same bike, in fact, as raced by Phil Atwell at the World Cup downhill races. Now on screen now, you can see a couple of different options of the bike. It comes in 27 and a half inch wheels and 29. In the 27 and a half, it's available in three models. In the 29, it's available in two models. And interestingly, in the 29, it's only available in sizes large and extra large. Propane feels that it's not appropriate for a shorter rider to basically get the benefit of a bigger size wheel because there's too many small issues, i.e. tire buzz and things like that. Now it's got a 63 degree head angle up front on there. It's a full carbon construction, really, really nice looking bike. I dare I say, actually, I think one of the nicest looking bikes on the scene at the moment. Now the chainstays have adjustable chainstay length, obviously to cater for different wheels, but also to cater for how you might want to ride that bike. They've got a flip chip on them. And interestingly, there's a reach adjustment on the front end of the bike there. So it's a, it's a 12 mil, so plus and minus six millimeters of adjustment. So on a size XL, you get 441, 451, and 461 millimeter options of your reach. So that's quite a cool thing. And we have seen that actually it was kind of pioneered by the Santa Cruz guys with their, their headstock system on their bikes when Minar was testing out his double XL size frame. So the chain stay, of course, is 445 and 449 in those two different settings. Very adjustable and very cool looking bike, I think. So next up is just a little bit more news on those Michelin DH22 tires we referred to back in show 30 a few weeks back that we've seen on Sam Hill's bike. Now, of course, it's a downhill tire. It's not one of their enduro tires, but we do think it might be using their Magi X, which is a super soft compound rubber that's notoriously grippy. Now, Sam obviously has been shredding the EWS on these tires and he loves them. Now, if you look on screen now, it's a screen grab from Cam Zink's Instagram page, and he says they're the baddest tire you've never ridden. Now, increasingly, we're seeing these appear more and more. They're not yet on the Michelin website, so we do think a launch is imminent. I, for one, really want to try that tire. I think the shoulders on this thing look incredible. Michelin, of course, have a good pedigree in the sport of mountain biking. They're famous for the old Comp 16s, which were later called the DH16s, and the Comp 24s. Again, they were later called the DH24s. Two of the most popular tires, and they were really, really ahead of their time back then. So it's going to be interesting to see how the times have changed for Michelin. So keep an eye out on the scene for Michelin tires coming soon. Now, next up is news of a new bicycle company called Trust Performance. Now, although they haven't currently got a bike out, if you just look at this, it's a holding page for the site. Now, personally, I'm really excited about this because the three people behind this are proper industry heavy hitters. So you've got Dave Weagle, who's very famous for the Dave Weagle link, the Delta system, lots of very good suspension designer tech there. Then there's also Jason Shears, who's ex Envy, so he's behind all the carbon fiber development. And finally, there's Haps Liga, who's the founder of online retailer Performance Cyclist. So you put those three together in a mixing pot, I think you're going to see something new suspension wise. It's certainly going to be carbon fiber and very exciting looking. So look out for this in the next coming week or so. I expect you're going to see a very cool bike being launched. And next up is news about the Saracen 2019 range. Of course, Saracen being a brand as ridden by Danny Hart. Now, first up, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Mist, which is a downhill bike. It's now available in a sort of a wallet-friendly aluminium build, which is fantastic. It's same geometry, same sort of thing that Danny rides. And of course, it is available in the carbon in a couple of different options. So there's the Mist, the Mist AL, the Mist Team, and the Mist Pro. So there's various different options there to suit every wallet. But also, there's a 27 and a half and a 29 inch version. They're completely different bikes. It's not the same with different flip chips and stuff like that. Now, the thing that's especially cool about these is they are the same bikes as ridden by Danny Hart and the World Cup Madison Saracen team. There's no different. They're not riding a fancy version. They are riding the production one that you can buy. So that's a really, really cool thing for Saracen. Now, next up, they've got a couple other cool bikes as well. In particular is the Mantra. So that's this one on screen now. Now, that stands for, well, the Mantra LSL stands for Long, Low and Slack. 
It's a hardtail, runs 130mm fork, 27.5 inch plus tyres. It looks really cool, but actually the one I prefer is the kids version or the youth model. And that's got 26 inch wheel. So it's making use of all that 26 inch componentry and stuff that we've had for so long, but actually finally putting it on a really good bike intended for kids. The whole bike looks fantastic to me. It just looks great for, no, in fact, not just kids, just anyone on the smaller side, making the most of a really well-designed bike. Now, the last one up from Saracen is the Traverse. Now, Traverse has always been a model in the Saracen range. Lots of friends of mine used to have those in the mid 90s, but thankfully this is a lot better than that. So it's a 29 inch wheel bike, runs 100 mil travel out back and 120 up front, which very much seems to be the sort of the new fashion creeping in with a trail bike with less travel. So it's basically got the cross country travel, but it's designed to be a bit harder hitting, a bit more sort of robust whilst retaining that agility. So it's a single pivot, it's linkage driven, it's really playful and it's got boost. I think this is a really cool looking bike. It's nice to see Saracen staying really up to date with things. And finally, last week I popped over to SRAM for a meeting about some cool stuff we're gonna be making with them soon. And I just took a few pictures. We weren't really allowed to see too much over there because they've got serious prototype stuff underway. But we did have a little snoop around the factory and it's very cool. So on screen is just some of the shots I took on my phone while we were there. And in particular, I was blown away by seeing where the SRAM cassettes come from. Now, of course, they are very expensive, but for good reason. They all start life as a lump that's over four kilos, absolutely massive lump, which is cold forged into a bell shape before it is machined into what you and I know as cassettes. And of course, that's a big lump of steel that's machined right down. It's very, very intricate. And then of course there's the aluminium upper sprocket, which is just a work of art. Combine the two pieces together with that XD driver body and it looks amazing. And it's really cool to actually see this process happening while we were there. And you can certainly see by how labor intensive it is, just how expensive they are. And actually I think it was cool, kind of all brought back into sort of relation there. It was also cool to see the different generations of the original XX1 derailleur. So on screen now you've got the original boxy sort of mock-up, I guess you'd call it. Then there's the first sort of prototype, which was a usable sample. And then as you can see, it refines all the way through to the production option there. But something else that caught my attention was an old cabinet from uh, the Zax days. So Zax is a company that SRAM are actually in their old factory now. And of course, Zax was one of the biggest employees in the town of Schweinfurt, where SRAM are based in Germany. And in fact, Schweinfurt are actually really famous for being a ball bearing hub of the world, really. So that's where ball bearings came from. And as such, in World War II, actually, it was bombed heavily because it would have had such a dramatic effect on production of machinery that used ball bearings. But anyway, so also looking through that cabinet of cool old stuff in there, I spotted something that looked to me like an electronic drivetrain from Zax, and it was. So it's a Speedtronic, and I do vaguely remember seeing these years back. It was 1994 when it first came out. Had to go back and do a bit of homework to find this out. But it's a seven speed electronic shifting system from Zax. Of course, it didn't really go anywhere, but it just goes to show that whatever's going on now, it has been done before, it has been experimented with. They just really didn't have the technology. And as we've seen on Nino Scherzer's bike, there's some very cool stuff coming from SRAM. And finally, we've got to have a little look at the huge SRAM tech truck. This thing is so cool. It's probably the ultimate bike cave in the world because you can be driven anywhere. And at some point soon, I'm going to have a look around and they'll give you a very cool truck tour. So keep an eye out for that one. Okay, so now it's time for bike cave. And as I promised last week, I'm just gonna throw you to myself this morning when I just got up and had a coffee. Uh, you have to excuse my tired eyes, a little tour around my own bike cave. Welcome to my pretty much finished bike cave. I'm quite happy with this now. Uh, we're living in a house at last. It's taken a couple of years to renovate this place, build this entire part of it, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, the workbench itself, you've pretty much seen. It's a bit of a utility area as well. I've got a washing machine down there and a sink, also useful for cleaning bike stuff, although um, I'm not sure my wife's gonna know about that stuff. Um, above the counter here, I've got this really cool picture by John Tomac, well it's of John Tomac in a race and he signed it, Doddy, go hard, Tomac. Super proud of that because Tomac was always like an idol of mine growing up. And also here's my custom bike, the AD160, which is built by Jeff Steber. Um, it's my geometry ideas on there and Jeff custom built it for me. And in fact, that's the bike right there. Um, I will actually take that out, I'm gonna give it a clean. It's got pretty soft tires at the moment, so it needs a bit of love on there, but 
I'm going to bring it back to life and show you guys because it's a pretty trick bike and it's way ahead of its time when it was designed. Obviously I've got tons of tyres all stacked up here, got the mud tyres there ready for the British winter, got my tool cab, cables, I've got all that stuff, that needs a massive sort out though because that is not good. But over this side I built this unit to basically house all of my cycling clothing so it's all stacked away nice and neat, in, well neatish anyway inside there. Got my GMBN jerseys and stuff, used to be a red locker and I repurposed it and also I used the last bit of my worktop, just happened to be the perfect size just to fit all the way along the end here. Alright so there's a bit of a gap at the top but that's a single piece so that's pretty good. Got my helmets hanging up on there, that door goes into the house. Um, I've got some helmet hooks on the wall here, kind of useful. Riding packs and stuff hang up there, of course got my park work stand and my trusty Topeak Joe Blow booster and pretty much everything I need to uh, work on my bikes and enjoy myself. Um, it's a pretty sweet spot. But keep sending your bike cables in. I love what you guys are doing. Honestly, it's one of the coolest sections of the show. I'm pretty sure the Dirt Show show is quite envious of it. So keep them coming in. And don't forget to use our uploader service. The link to it is on the screen right now. It's super easy to use. And there's also a click through link below this very video in the description. Really easy to take those pictures of your bike case. Don't forget to let us know all the cool details so we can read them out on next week's show. Get them in guys. Now it's time for Rewind and this week, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be showing any of your guys amazing entries. We'll make sure we'll go XL on that next week. But I wanna give you a little bit of a lesson on something so cool this has even blown my mind. So the bike on screen now is known as a Yeti C26. It's a very, very rare bike. In fact, there's only seven known bikes completed in existence. Now the reason this is so cool is because this particular one is a little different from the main story. But I'll get there in a second. So originally this was built for John Tomac. This one here is a replica. And Julie Furtado also raced one of these at the 1990 World Championships. So the frame itself has got the Yeti FRO sort of basis to it. It's got the curved seat and chainstay loop out the back. They're very famous for on there. And of course you can see the drop handlebars. You can see those carbon main tubes and a whole bunch of other amazing stuff like that Shimano XT seat post. Did you even know that Shimano made posts back then? Super, super rare stuff on there. Of course there's the Tioga disc drive and a whole number of other amazing stuff. I think you'll agree it's a pretty special looking retro bike. But the thing, that's really, really cool about this. So the name, the Yeti C26, comes from the designer of this, whose name is Chris Herting, so that's the C in it, and he was 26 years of age when he made the bike, hence the C26. So that's the first cool thing. The second cool thing is the fact that the tube tolerances between the steel lugs and the Eastern C9 Alu carbon Kevlar and carbon fiber wrapped tubes were so tight that when they bonded it together, you were never assured of enough bonding agent or glue actually being on the tube to make that connection. So as they rejigged the rest of the frame as they were building it, they could never be sure how strong the frame actually was. And rumor has it that John Parker, so Mr. Yeti in those days, thanked God the entire way home from those world championships just for the fact that Julie Furtado's bike did not break. And as soon as he got that bike back to Yeti and retrieved all of the other ones, the whole project was scrapped. So even though there was enough tube sets to build 50 bikes, only seven were actually produced. But the cool story is actually what happened to the rest of those tube sets. Now, one original frame sold for a remarkable $12,000 to a German collector on eBay. So it's kind of no wonder that something else didn't really happen to these. And this particular bike has got quite a cool story. So there's a collector called Kevin Miller, and he's a quite a known collector on the Retro Bike Forum. If you've never heard of Retro Bike before, I urge you to check it out. It's a very cool site. They've also got Facebook and Instagram handles there. So check that out. The link to that is in the description below this week's tech video. Now he was desperate to build one of these and he somehow acquired some of these original C9 tubes from an unknown source in Durango, so some of those original tubes basically. And he also acquired an original Yeti FRO, so for racing only frame, which he was gonna use as the donor, in which case to cut the main tubes out and have these other tubes bonded in place. So he sent that frame to Chris Herting, who basically built the original ones, 
and Chris turned it back into an original C26 frame. So it's a reissue, but using the original components. So it's basically like a, a replica. And then it took him the following two years to source all of the stuff on it. I just look at this thing, it's mind-blowingly cool. Two years to get all that stuff and build this bike. It's a very, very special bike. And now it's currently living at Silverfish UK and its owner, Darren Mabbott, who, if anyone knows this guy, he's got a collection of Yeti bikes. And he's got, in fact, he's got a couple of Mountain Cycle San Andreas. He's got loads of cool stuff. I absolutely love the story behind this bike. The amount of effort it took to recreate this thing. And I can see why it's Darren's pride and joy. I just wanna say thank you to Darren for lending us the bike to enable us to get these shots, which I think everyone will agree, the bike looks unreal. So once again, a thank you to Darren to sending that bike to us for, so we could get that. And thanks for all the information about that story. Truly, truly brilliant, that. So if anyone out there knows of something else equally as amazing or dated and retro as this, then let us know because I think we'd like to do some more content like this and so maybe some longer form content too. So hit us up at the usual address. And of course, use the uploader if you're sending some bikes into us. Use the hashtag rewind, of course. All right, guys, now it's time for Top Mods, where you guys get to send in video footage, photos, and the stories of all those cool modifications you've been making to your bikes. Whatever they are, even if you just change the chain, take some pictures, tell us about it. How was your experience? Was it good? Was it bad? Did it cost you a lot of money? Did it take you two days to do it? Whatever it is, send it in. We love hearing how you guys work on your bikes, how you improve your bikes, and how you make them a bit different from the others. Don't forget to use our uploader service. The link is below this video. It's super easy. Get your stuff in. So first up this week is from um, Anne. Is it Anne? Is it an ant? I don't really know. It's just A-N. Uh, A-N from USA. This year saw my bike go from rigid to hardtail to full suspension. I don't have the money, the room, and the time for another full bike, so this is the best option. Right, so check this out. So. In the first picture, you can see a Surly with, uh, well, it's a hardtail setup at the moment. Um, 29 inch wheels on there. Looking pretty trick, actually. I do like those Surleys. Nice, low slung, quite aggressive looking bike. And then the next shot is turned into a Santa Cruz Hightower and a Surly's up on the workbench there. So that's pretty cool, actually, just basically doing a, a full frame swap. So I guess maybe you might ride the, the Surly in winter conditions and the the uh, high tower in summer, perhaps. Not really sure, but either way, I like what you're doing. That's that's cool to have a kind of a modular setup you can move around. Um, is that even is that the same seat post? If it is, that's super cool that you've literally managed to get the good combination. You've got the same cranks on there, the same wheels, same forks, same bar position. Even it looks. That's a good attention to detail. I really like that, and I do like your workspace as well. By the way, I like the fact you've got a bench mounted. Work stand there, I've got a nice salsa. Is that a road or a cross bike? Can't quite see there, but it looks pretty cool either way. So thanks for sending that one in, Anne. Um, next up is from CJ in Adelaide, Australia. I saw the video and love the idea. So I used an old ice cream container to make the tongue guard. Uh, keep up the great videos. Nice, okay, yeah, so you made yourself one of those front mud guards using a bit of a milk bottle. Uh, in fact, ice cream container, you just said that. I don't know why I said milk bottle. That's because I made one out of a milk bottle, I guess. Um, and you're using hashtag GMBN tech, hashtag GMBN, always good to see. Nice one, CJ, thanks for sending that in, good work. You'll also like this one, the next one is from Ben in Chepstow. This weekend, I tried a new maintenance job and revalved the damper on my X-Fusion Sweep RL2. Like many others, I feel the standard fortune doesn't have very good small bump compliance. I've been running with uh, lower pressure to compensate, but it's a bit divey on the techie stuff. By shifting the second shim and the stack behind one of the small pivot shims, the early or low force damping is reduced slightly. Even though it's a simple change, it's my first go at proper internal suspension tuning, so I'm keen to see the difference and see what else I can do with the shim stacks. Yeah, that's a really cool way around that, Ben. Actually, I need to uh, consider some stuff like that myself. I like what you've done there. And yeah, it makes perfect sense that that shim, flipping it the other way around, would just enable it to break away a little bit more. Good work. Nice selection of images too. Always nice to see that. So uh, thank you everyone for sending those in, some really good top mods there. Keep them coming in, we love them. All right, now it's time for Tech of the Week. And as you can see here, I've got a few bits and pieces to show you. So there's a new Nuke Proof bars here. These are the Sam Hill editions. They come in three different rises. Let's just have a quick look through these. 
So this one is the 20 mil rise. It's a full 800 mil width. And as you can see by the cut marks here, Sam runs his at 750, bang on. But I'm gonna run these at full 800. Like I said, there's three different rises in these. There's the 20. There is, you bear with me in here. There is the big boy, which is a 38. Well, that is the one I'm gonna run because I really like a high bar because I like to roll them forwards a little bit more to try and get a little bit more reach out of my bike. And there's a slightly lower one as well, all of which look super cool. I think you'll find very nice looking bar there. And that's Sam's personal sort of choice on there too. But there's also the stem. So I did show you the prototypes or stages of these a couple of weeks back when we had those renders. And we've actually got the stems in the flesh. Now they come in three sizes. They come in 60, they come in 50 and 35. So that's a 60. And they come in a range of colors. They come in red, blue, black, and my favorite color. In fact, the rest of these are almost irrelevant in my eyes once I saw this other color. The red and black, I think you'll find, do look really, really cool. And I know that Dan, Dan the cameraman, has got his eye on the red one to go on his nice new Orbea, but it's all about this one. As far as I'm concerned, the copper, that is the most badass looking stem I've seen in a long time. 35 mil, that is the length I like to run. I think that is absolutely gorgeous. These retail for uh, 59.95 and they're available about now, as far as I know. Super, super nice bit of kit from Nuke Proof there. So there you go, there's three different bar options, three different rises, uh, four different colorways in the stems and the three length options there. So stems, about 60 quid and the bars, about 55 quid. Although I'm pretty sure you can get them a little bit cheaper if you hunt around online, but nice, good, simple series of stuff. Good kit. All right, now it's time for bike build. Now, earlier on, we went over to TF Tuned Shocks at an official suspension tuning service center in the UK. They're also a distributor for Bike Yoke. So we went over there, take the bike build over there. Okay, at last we're over at TF Tuned Shocks. I've got the bike build shock and fork in my hand here. This is the bad boy here, just taking these off and Finn is gonna be the guy working on them. I think the aim is to make the shock a bit more progressive, but more importantly, to make sure the fork matches that so it's a nice balanced feel front and rear. And let's see what Finn has to say on that. Nice, it's in good nick, which you'd expect from a brand new shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no volume spaces in there. No volume spaces, no. Standard. So we'll change that. <laughs> So first up, Finn basically took apart the rear shock and although there was nothing wrong with it, he filled it up with the biggest volume spaces on there because the way I would want to ride that bike is quite hard and I'd want it to feel quite progressive. As it is, it felt fairly linear. So we got that to ramp up nicely and he put all new lube in there, loads of it too. And he also changed the little valve core on the inside for what they say is a slightly more reliable one because sometimes you can damage those with shock pumps and I've done that in the past. But something that was really cool that I saw there that I've not seen done before was the way the shock was charged up inside. Now they had these special machines so I think it's just about to charge the pump up. Normally, well, you can do this with a syringe, and I've not seen this system before. Just tell us a bit about this. Um, this is an Adriani. It's a vacuum bleeder, basically. So what it does, it creates a vacuum inside the shock and does that for about two minutes. And then it'll switch over to positive charge and it fires and the oil in, up. fills it up. Um, it's nice and quick um, and it ensures that there's no air bubbles. Because what can happen is with the shim stack and with the piston, the air will sit inside that stuff. piston. Okay. So if you're doing it by hand, you can only cycle it slowly. Yeah, yeah. By forcing the oil through there, it blows all the air out of the system, basically. And I guess the advantage working somewhere like this is you can plug that in, you can get with someone else while it's doing it. Yeah, rather I can, than monitoring. I can plug this in, um, and then obviously you need to change the air can seals. Yeah. Uh, this will sit there, do its thing. Five minutes later, come back to it. That's and cool. And it's ready to roll. Good so. big kit. Yeah. Got three of them. The shock was put back on the bike and instantly it just felt slightly smoother. I think it's just, you know, fresh lube, all that sort of stuff. It'd been sat there not doing anything for quite a while, even though it's a brand new shock. The fork was the interesting thing though. So TF Tuned were actually very, like they praised the damping system on that X-Fusion. They say it's actually quite a lot of good range of adjustment in both high and low speed compression there. So it's really down to how the fork is going to be ridden that defines the setup. But 
I wasn't quite happy with the breakaway force on the fork. I wanted it to feel a bit more supple and I also wanted it to ramp up more, which of course that's all down to the air leg on there. So Finn stripped the fork down and had a good look at the inside. And something that was immediately apparent was the, the air tube at the bottom where it slides into the stanchion tube and into the sort of the air chamber. There's actually quite a bit of stiction with that and a bit of a knocking at the, like the first sort of initial part of the movement. And we can actually wiggle it around within there and you could feel it almost binding. It doesn't feel like brilliant to be fair. No, it doesn't. And quite often that can be to do with lubricant, although it's got what looks like something similar to red rum in there. It's quite thin, a little bit watery, but you can see what's going on. Now, as he took the whole system apart, it was quite clear the part of the design, it's a rod that goes into uh, like a little ball joint to enable it to move i guess if the fork was binding that would allow the air tube to consistently move up and down the fork to continue working which i think we agreed was a really smart way of working but the actual ball joint itself had movement in it and the quad seal around that had quite a lot of stiction to it so well that was a very good quad seal it was very dry so we sorted that out we put a load of fresh grease around there and he put some different o-rings in there that got rid of that initial sort of knocking movement and it literally even just cycling that air tube on its own into the stanchion tube you could see the fact it was it just had such little friction compared to what it did to start with and then because of the design of the fork there wasn't really any compatible option for volume spaces in there but because it didn't have a negative spring it had a coil negative spring on there so like quite old school but they're really reliable so it's quite a good system in modern forks you need air volume spacers and the reason you need those instead of putting oil in that chamber is if you put oil in the chamber to raise the oil height and change the air volume space in there the problem you have is the oil clogs up the ports between the positive and negative chambers basically it can't equalize and it will never work properly but because this fork had the coil spring system in there he covered that in heavy duty grease and then put it back together and then before we put the air cap back in I think we put uh, 10 or 15 cc's of, of float fluid in there to really make the fork ramp up a lot more towards the end of travel. And putting the fork back together, you know, doing the weight test on the bike, it felt amazing. It feels really, really well balanced front and rear, which is exactly what I wanted the bike to feel like. So I'm super happy with that. And of course, it bears a couple of TF tuned stickers, which any fork or any shock that goes through there gets their sort of seal of approval once it's been fully tested afterwards just a really cool process to see and see how those people are constantly churning these out every day and uh, something else that was also quite cool that we didn't capture on film just because of sound reasons is the fact that those guys as they're working on the forks and shocks there they're wired in as well they're chatting to consumers and customers and telling them how to solve problems with their own stuff at the same time as they're working on stuff and the stuff that all of the technicians know there is second to none it's absolutely amazing to see them work so now finally the bike build bike is finished so i'm going to take it out this week i'm going to shoot the bike so you can see all of it in its nice well in its natural habitat really i've got a very cool place to go and shoot it i'm going to tell you a bit about the bike and you'll find out what i'm going to do with it so there we go there's another weekly show in a bag i hope you enjoyed it let us know what you think of us going out and about and doing a bit more stuff because it's certainly stuff that i would like to do but i want to know what you guys want us to do so let us know in those comments below and we will start tailoring the show a little bit more each week as we go for a couple more great videos click up here for an EMBN video this is all about Chris Smith so he's he's a free rider basically he's now riding uh, an electric mountain bike he's doing 360s he's doing bar spins all the crazy stuff find out all about Chris up here very cool video and not what you think as well and click down here if you want to find out how to set up a suspension fork it's one of our essentials series videos as always, click on the round globe to subscribe to GMBN Tech and help us get to 100,000 subscribers. And as always, if you love GMBN Tech, give us a thumbs up.